Origins of Swarm Suji Reaction, this is Olympic Sniper turned Battleship Commander, Willis Ching Lee. So Ching is a nickname. Uh, this was another fat uh, Battle Sniper turned Battleship Commander. Okay, so this is another naval video. It's gonna be awesome about USA. Being a sniper has anything to do with battleship? What, you can snipe with battleship if you're like a sniper? I mean, aiming is aiming, who knows? So yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, so this is the new uh, Factorition video. It was posted, uh, I guess, two days ago or something. Yeah, uh, yeah, about two days. So this, you know, this is like a story about, uh, you know, badass. Uh, there is, there's two versions of things. Usually Factorition talks about badass people. No, there's more than two, but I like this too. It's badass people and badass events. I think it was just like two weeks ago when he posted uh, the, you know, Vietnam MiG story, uh, which, which was insane, which was really important video for me because kind of clear things up about Vietnam. Many people should watch that. Uh, you know, people needs to like, you know, uh, send that video to, you know, other friends or something because awareness on that is important because whenever it comes to like Vietnam, people always like joke about it. Why? Oh, USA lost against Vietnam. USA hasn't won a war in a long time, all that. But that really clears things up like how politician basically made sure you're not gonna win any war there, right? There was many elements very many political BS. But it just, made, it just made me think that, you know, people just wanted the war to stretch out in U.S. politics. So, I don't know, they can profit or something. So, this is about, uh, I don't know which war it is. I don't know, but it's like Olympic sniper. Whenever it's like, don't touch our boats, that's when things go crazy. So, yeah, let's watch it. <coughs> Remember, if you like my and don't subscribe. So, you know, that way, I know which type of videos to react to more. I watch many different type of videos on this channel. Uh, history, science, uh, seminar type, you know, comedy, slash history, I don't know. Uh, g general videos, uh, real life lore, things like that, and recently military style videos like this. <clears throat> so you know, uh, what uh, what video gets more interaction of any kind? That's how I usually like try to aim what type of videos to watch next. So yeah, and comment if you want to do any specific video as well. And let's watch it. This man is the greatest gunslinger of all time, and you've probably never even heard of him. Today we're talking about Willis Augustus Lee, aka Ching Lee. This man won five Olympic gold medals in a single year for shooting, then went on to become a battleship commander and used the same principles that he learned at long range precision shooting and applied them to the massive 16 inch guns on the USS Washington to become the most successful battleship commander ever. And he did all of it with myopia. But first a word from our sponsor, this video is brought to you by Delete Me. Oh Nicholas, I thought you would never ask. Is that a real MP5? Come and find out. I uh, I gotta, I gotta go. I'll be right back. One minute, maybe two. Sorry about that. Like I was saying, this video is brought to you by Delete Me. All right, here's the deal. It's super straightforward. Wait a minute. Is that tax cut there on the couch? As I've learned recently in one of those fat files video, whatever put on put on that couch is like you can cross off as like work related things or something. Or you give Delete Me money, they turn around and they make sure the data brokers on the internet aren't selling your personal information because if Delete Me submits an opt-out request, these data brokers are legally required to take that information down and quit selling it. The problem is there's hundreds of data brokers and they make it unnecessarily difficult to submit these opt-out requests. So Delete Me does all of that for you. And yes, most of these data brokers more than likely have your information because we've all signed up for a free trial or we've all downloaded a free app. And whenever you click that little check mark that now we're gonna sell you. I think we can all agree that's not cool, but that's the unfortunate fact of life. Nothing is actually free. But here's the good news. You sign up for Delete Me, you use the discount code electrician, it's gonna save you 20%. You're gonna end up paying like $6 a month to get all your information deleted off the internet and all that free shit that you've already enjoyed. While it might not actually be free, Delete Me can make sure it only costs you like $6 a month instead of having all your personal information sold on the internet. So go check them out. I'll have that link and discount code down below. Let's get back to the video. On today's episode of Badasses with Bad Eyesight, Ching Lee, born in a small town in Kentucky in 1888, his father was a local judge and had a lifetime passion for oh, shooting, a love for shooting that he would pass on to his son, Lee Jr. By the time Lee was 10 years old, he was such a good shot that he could shoot a bird in flight with his 22. Because of that, he became his small local town's pest exterminator. Anytime anybody had any rodent or any type of pest that they wanted gotten rid of, they would call the young Ching Lee and he would take care of it for them. In addition to his passion for shooting, he also thoroughly enjoyed blowing shit up for fun because, well, there's not a whole lot to do in Kentucky in the early 1900s and America. Oh! 
There is poop on everything. Unfortunately for Lee, this. <laughs> I was about to say like, okay, obviously it's America. How to get rid of rodents? I don't know. Bring a gun. This 44 Magnum there. There you go. Yeah. To bring about a lifetime full of problems because one day him and his brother decided to fill a coffee can full of black powder, have a line of black powder leading away from the can so that they could light it safely. They lit it, the fire went all the way down the line of black powder into the can, and nothing happened. So they waited, and then nothing continued to happen. So finally, oh. Willis Lee approached the can, no. looked at it, got close, opened it up, and then it blew up in his face, giving him severe burns all over his face and eyes. Yeah. Due to the severity Noxian. of the burns, it was believed in the days immediately following the accident that Lee would be blind for the rest of his life. Fortunately, he would regain a significant amount of his eyesight. However, his eyes were permanently damaged and he would have to wear thick glasses for the rest of his life. So obviously the young Ching Li was a pretty random- Oh, that's so fucked up, right? Whenever we lit a fireworks, right? Uh, there's a firework here and basically it's had its gunpowder in it, right? The different type of fireworks, this specific type of fireworks here, it's called Sutri Bomb, I don't know. I don't know. It's like made of, you know, there's like, you know, a lot of uh, gunpowder inside and there's like a, I don't know, there's like, rope type of things you you know like basically it's it's kind of like loud it's, i don't know to americans it's not loud but yeah it's it's not your bit just like any other firecracker type of way so if, as a kid i still remember like when you let it go to safety something like what the fuck when it doesn't go off it's like oh my god should i go close to it do it what if it like explodes and sometimes they take a long time right i don't know because uh you know like primer or whatever got damp or something so yeah we just slowly burning then you're like oh it didn't explode you go close and it just explodes then what the fuck bunctious kid and that translated over into the classroom as well because he is the classic case of the kid that's so smart that school doesn't interest him or keep him stimulated so he has a bad habit of giving off task and doing things he shouldn't be doing uh mainly he was a prankster and a humongous smart ass for example when he was 12 years old he was already chewing tobacco and the teacher would always confiscate his pouch of tobacco walk it across the schoolhouse and throw it into the wood burning furnace in the corner finally lee got sick of the teacher burning up all his tobacco so he went home emptied tobacco out of the tobacco pouch Pouch, filled it full of black powder and stuck that in his pocket and waited to go to school the next day. Sure enough, teacher confiscates the pouch of black powder, walks it over to the furnace, throws it in, blows up the entire wood furnace. And then, in true smartass fashion, when Lee got in trouble for it, he said, Look, this isn't my fault. You took my shit, didn't ask me what it was, and then threw it into fire. That's 100% on you. On another occasion, the teacher had the audacity to send Lee home because his shoes weren't shined enough. So, he went home, shined his shoes, stuck paper sacks over his shoes, and tied them up top with a rope. He then walked to school and refused to take the paper bags off because he didn't want his shoes to become unshined and not be within the school's dress code. With the culmination of all these things lee's father realized usually i'm um, with uh, with the story and all things but <laughs> look man teacher is there to discipline you right it might it might feel shitty and there are shitty teachers i'm not saying that but yeah the, it, they're trying to show you discipline when they say like always oh, sign your shoes right uh if they just let go of once they go lot let go of all the times so that's not how discipline works tobacco thing is like health related things right in hindsight thinking about now that's like yeah tobacco is not good for you in any stretch of the way right yeah, then they didn't realize it that much but still so if anything teacher was trying to help the kid right obviously kid main kid it makes sense and this kid is not just a man either the other kid knowing from the title but yeah <laughs> That he needs to get his son into the military as soon as possible so he has some way to positively channel all of this energy otherwise he's going to end up in jail or worse so being that he was already a judge he pulled some strings gets his kid into annapolis at the age of 16. annapolis is where he would get his lifelong nickname of ching originally it was a different c word that's actually a racial slur apparently it changed to ching over time just because it was easier to say now they didn't give him that name because he is asian he's a white dude from kentucky uh, however he does kind of look what? like he could be asian he wears round thick glasses Glasses. his last name is Lee, and he is a huge Asian history nerd. Sometimes even going as far as signing his signature in Chinese symbols. What I'm trying to tell you is if this were modern times, this dude would definitely be watching anime. Kakarot, you've never kissed someone? Huh? No, of course not. Why? You're married and have children. Yeah, duh, but what's that have to do with kissing? You now, for his entire four years at Annapolis, <laughs> he is thoroughly unamused. Oh, right. Okay, he was writing in Chinese. That's like next level thing. Uh, Mandarin and Chinese in general, all the languages, is kind of really hard, right? So him learning that just like already shows you that like you're, let's just say he's smarter than the average people, right? Around that time, no internet, obviously. Around that time, learning all this shit, yeah. 
involved with coursework, he pretty much speeds through it as fast as humanly possible so he can get back to studying things that he likes and going out and shooting guns. Now, because of this, he does join the Navy shooting team and his senior year, he gets an opportunity to go represent the Navy in a huge national competition put on by the National Rifle Association. At this competition, there is a rifle competition and a pistol competition. Lee has been selected to participate in the rifle competition. Now, this rifle competition is a huge deal. There are 684 people there competing and they are all qualified to be there. Regardless, Ching Lee ends up winning first place, earning the gold medal by getting a bullseye at a thousand yard target and he wins the entire thing before lunch. Not really having anything else to do for the rest of the day. He's like, fuck it. I guess I'll go do the pistol comp. To put it in the context, you can't do that in a video game. You need to practice even in the video game with a mouse and keyboard or whatever controller. And he's doing that in real life competition now too, just for funsies. Fast forward about 80% of the way through this pistol competition and Ching Lee is winning and he wasn't even there to compete in the pistol competition. And as he's shooting different targets, his pistol blows up in his hand because one of the rounds that he had had too much black powder in it from the factory. It blew up his gun and messed up his hand. Not giving a shit, turns around to his buddies. Oh my God, the time where things weren't just that. Well. In today's world, we see things as this is the one thing I can use. It's gonna work. Somehow that's our mentality, even with the cars. I remember the time I was like really small, but cars were really hard, like no power steering, a lot of things you need to know about it. It will go bad, you know, if like it's not really good car, right? Uh, so th there is there is many things like that, right? And if, you, if you're wondering, like that hasn't been the case for decades. I live in India, so it's different. In USA, that wasn't the case. In India, that was a few decades ago. So, uh, you know... Gun, gun even today, right? If you, if you have a gun, if you clean it just good enough, it's gonna probably work with the technology that we have today. Back then, even guns exploding in your head because there was too much powder. So imagine the mentality of people like have to learn all this shit and go with the risk of those things, right? In today's world, people, uh, you know, are, are not used to things like this. Things just, you know, not working the way it's supposed to. People just like, well, something doesn't work after years and like, ah, oh, piece of shit. Really? After years? It never broke once. It's like, what, eight, nine years? It doesn't matter what, anything. And people get pissed off nowadays. Back then, people, things were made, you know, in, to do certain things, and it just, like, fails half of the time. And people are like, oh, that's how it works. People's mentality were different back then compared to today. And if anything, people are becoming more entitled nowadays because of it. I don't know. He's watching somebody throw me a pistol. He grabs it, catches it with his left hand, finishes the round with his non-dominant hand and goes on to win the pistol competition as well, earning two gold medals, being the only American to do it. So after that, he goes back to Annapolis. He's got both of his gold medals. He's basically the Kevin Gates of gold medals, if you will, and it's time to graduate. Now, bad news, he has to take a physical first and after going all the way through Annapolis schooling, finishing the program and just winning two gold medals in a national shooting competition they decide you're not qualified to actually join the navy because well your vision's not good enough ah, i knew it the fact fucking knew it this is what third story from federation where there's like oh your eyes are not good even though you just like won olympic medal this is bullshit mm -hmm. i was wondering why my face was lighting up so much but then i realized there's no room light on okay that you just scored a bullseye at a thousand yards last week. So at this point, Ching Lee does exactly what every other badass with bad eyesight would do, and he cheats on that fucking eye exam and makes his way into the Navy. Yes! Now, as an officer in training, he gets shuffled around to a bunch of different ships to get a bunch of different experiences, figure out what he likes doing, figure out what he's good at, get him exposed to everything. That's how this is supposed to go. During that time, he actually publishes his first ever article, and it's about the proper way of shooting a pistol. It gets published in the Naval Magazine, and he actually signs his signature at the bottom with a Chinese symbol again. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I like the quote that he actually put in this magazine. And that was, focus on acquiring accuracy before you try to acquire speed, which is eerily similar to the famous quote from also famous gunslinger, Wyatt Earp, fast is fine, but accuracy is final. You gotta learn how to be slow in a hurry. My point being, game, recognize game. They're both onto something and you should probably write that shit down. Now, the young Lee finally makes his way onto the USA. Basically, that's the mentality of military in modern world, right? Yes, obviously, accuracy by volume, but accuracy is definitely important, right? Uh, surgical strikes are like considered better war zone than anything else, right? Even in video games, when you play, you, you like to play a sniper rather than machine gun guy, because sniper is cool. One shot, one kill is cool, basically. And why is it cool? Because it's better. Something wouldn't be cool if it wasn't better. 
USS New Hampshire, and that is when the occupation of Veracruz happens. All right, super brief, oversimplified version of what's happening right now. It is 1914, and Mexico is having a revolution, and the new Mexican government is not a huge fan of the United States of America. Because of that, the Tempico Affair ends up happening, which is the Mexican government basically captures and detains a bunch of American sailors for a little while. It's a big diplomatic nightmare between Mexico and the United States. Because of that, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, decides that he's going to put an embargo on Mexico, and he's not going to let any guns into the country because he's scared that they're going to use them against America. And in April of 1914, Mexico gets a huge shipment of firearms despite the embargo. If so facto, Woodrow Wilson sends in the Navy and the Marines to go get those weapons back. Now bear in mind, this is 1914. There's no Higgins boats. There's no amphibious landing vehicles. Nobody's doing D-Day type shit. So there's literally just a bunch of Navy and Marine dudes getting driven ashore in whaling boats, hopping out and going to find these guns, I guess, because the president said so. So since, you know, America's basically invading Mexico, some of the Mexicans get pretty pissed off, obviously, so they start shooting at the Americans, which, you know, not super happy about it, but I understand the sentiment. I would do the same thing if I were in their shoes. Now, unfortunately for them, the downside of shooting at people is they're probably going to shoot back, you know, assuming... Would you though, it's, um, I get it's 1914, it's not like modern day America, but America was still economical powerhouse, right? <sighs> would you shoot at America at that point? Uh, if you're Mexico, I don't know. Well, how was Mexico doing back then? I mean, today, Mexico fighting back against USA just feels weird. Like, what the fuck? That, that, that would never... They, they wouldn't be in that point, I think, right? Uh, Mexico wouldn't even think of that. Back then, how powerful was Mexico, right? I don't know. But still, like, it feels weird. Like, okay, can we resolve this better or something? I don't know. They have guns, which... America always does. Now, somewhere along the line, Lee's entire unit gets pinned down by these enemy snipers that are up on top of roofs and inside of windows and high buildings, basically shooting at guys lower on the ground, and nobody's able to shoot these guys back, and everybody's just pinned down where they're at. So, Lee, remembering, like, oh, shit, I'm the main character with bad eyesight, I got this, grabs his gun and just walks out in the middle of the street corner in broad fucking daylight with no cover whatsoever, and he just sits there with his gun. Sure enough, after a couple of seconds, somebody finally shoots at him, but they miss. And now, Lee saw where they're at, and Lee shoots back, and remember, Ching Lee doesn't miss. And then he continues to sit there, and somebody shoots at him, and they miss, and Lee shoots back and Lee don't miss. And this goes on for a while, pretty much until they quit shooting at Lee, presumably because there was none of them left. When asked about this later in life, the only thing Lee would say was, quote, yeah, I think I got a couple of them. Of all the men that were there and actually saw it, many of them had a much less modest version of this story to tell. I mean, look, Ben, uh, during the uh, you know, medal time, his gun explosion is in, in his hand. He's like, oh my God, blood. Just, did he run to inform, you know, whatever, like medical part? No, he's just like, oh, give me another gun. That guy is not worried about getting shot once or twice, right? And he's like, oh, this is better strategy because clearly I can shoot them back. So I can just kill them with accuracy. With some of them claiming as many as 12 men were dispatched by Lee, all the while he was giving them the first chance to shoot at him. Then later during this Veracruz side quest, Lee is also credited again with saving a man's life by running through gunfire to get him and provide medical attention. The man is literally Clint Eastwood, except it's 1914 and he's real. You know, you're gonna look awfully silly with that knife sticking up your ass. You still here? Uh, no. Now, because of the bravery he displayed at Veracruz, he's put up for promotion by his leadership, and he gets denied because his vision is too bad. And at this point, his entire chain of command is basically writing letters of recommendation, essentially yelling at the entire- I was about to say, writers, <laughs> letters of you know, recommendation, now that's more like in the background screaming, are you fucking kidding me? Did you know what the, what the dude just did? What you talking about? That is like the closest thing to screaming at somebody medical bureaucratic side of the Navy that's denying him that they're insane because this guy's awesome. Seriously, he gets like 20 letters of recommendation from high ranking officers, including the skipper of his current vessel, the USS New Hampshire. And in that letter, he says something along the lines of, I saw Lee crumple a man from 800 yards with iron sights at Veracruz he can see just fine. So his promotion gets taken into consideration for an extended period of time, and because of that, he gets taken off sea duty and gets sent basically to the middle of the country, and he is working for the U.S. Navy, going to different factories and figuring out what these factories need to do to be able to better manufacture stuff for the U.S. Navy. During this time, he meets his wife in Oskaloosa, Iowa. Then America enters World War I, and he... 
This is a problem with America in general. I've realized is with all this that nobody wants to get stuck with the blame, and everybody just wanna follow rules as it states. I guess there's a place for that. Obviously, there's a reason why American democracy is surviving multiple centuries. If you follow something like that, yes, it's gonna cause problems, but you're following the book, right? Uh, chance of something bad happening is gonna you know lessen from that point of point on, I guess, or some uh, evil element. Why am I having a hard time saying anything? Some evil element rising up becomes lesser because everybody just follows what they're supposed to do, right? Sometimes it feels robotic, sometimes it feels stupid like this, but I can kind of see that. But nobody wants to risk with common sense, like what if I end up with the blame if anything goes wrong? So even though they know all this thing is true, but still the book says eyesight issue, you know, it falls under the whatever recommended thing is, I can't let you do it, do it that kind of way. He gets sent over to Europe, although he does not get attached to a combat vessel, so he never actually sees combat. After World War I, Lee would go on to compete in the 1920 Olympics, where he would actually win seven medals, five gold, one silver, one bronze, which would turn out to be the record for the most medals won by any one person at any one Olympic Games, and that record would stand until 1980. Okay, just so we're on the same page, dude just won five gold Olympic medals for sharpshooting, and he's having trouble getting promoted because he has bad eyesight. Anyways, for the rest of the 1920 20s, Lee spends pretty much the entire time working on different destroyers, just working his way up the ranks, becoming a bigger and better leader. Now about his style of leadership, everybody absolutely loves this guy that works with him because he has this way where he just teaches people what they need to do, and if they're not good at it, he gets them good at it, and then he just lets them do their job. He doesn't try to micromanage them, he's not up everybody's ass, he just wants to get people where they need to be so they have the skills they need so that they can do their job, and then he goes and dicks off so he can go do target practice and build traps to kill rats because because that was like his new hobby. That was seriously what he was known for, building elaborate mouse traps on destroyers. He had ones that were like air guns rigged up to trip wires that would shoot rats, which is the most American shit I've ever heard of in my entire life. There was another one that was really popular where he had a little yeah, miniature guillotine before, right? that he had electrically rigged up to a push button on his desk and all the boys would sit there and play a game when the rat would run across it, they would try to hit the button just in time to cut the rat in half. And then like whenever there was anything to shoot at from the ship, he had his own private stash of guns in his quarters and he would run out and there'd be these like glass balls from abandoned fishing nets that would be floating in the ocean and he'd run out and shoot at them from the deck and he'd invite the marines to come out and shoot with him over the PA system and he was actually out there teaching the marines how to become better shots. Everybody absolutely loved this guy. So that goes on until about yeah, for his defense, there was no PlayStation or Xbox back then. So there you go, you do what you do. <laughs> oh, this is this is the thing he was doing, wasn't it? Uh, you know, like shooting rats and things long before. It just became his hobby. Why not? <laughs> doing all these elaborate things just to kill rats. Oh, that's so good. 1930 and then he finally makes his way back onto battleships and heavy cruisers at which point he gets absolutely obsessed with gunnery he wants to shoot the big guns better than anybody ever has he actually ends up writing a paper that later on got published talking about how battleships need to take into consideration the curvature of the earth when they're gathering targeting data and he develops the calculations for the battleships to do the, the dude just started doing physics oh i love him already this is so good do that. He's literally teaching people how to treat a battleship the way a sniper treats a gun, and it's highly effective. Because after publishing that paper, another battleship commander actually took that data and started implementing it, and his battleship won most accurate ship for the next three years in a row, and he said it was all due to Lee's calculations. Okay, if you're not catching on, Lee is actually treating his naval career the same way he treated his academic career. He's not interested in the normal coursework of like leading and micromanaging a bunch of sailors. He wants to get everybody where they need to be. He wants to get through his work as fast as he can so that he can go do stuff that interests him, like pioneering new ways to be accurate with gunnery. Because of this, he develops a reputation as a problem solver. I mean, that is his kind of a job. Not job, but that is the thing. If, if you really like people like him want to do stuff, you would do, right? You're a commander of battleship, right? Sniper, battleship sniper, kind of the same thing at a larger scale. I'm imagining, you know, battleship back then especially were not that accurate, right? Not like stormtroopers, but like not that accurate. Something like Lee things would kind of would be like, you know, tide changer. If you're accurate enough, like, yeah, one ship could be enough to like overpower things. Over So, late 1930s, they send him over to Washington, D.C., and his orders are basically, get everybody ready for war because we know it's coming. Okay, now this is probably the least coolest but most important part of the entire story. This man essentially gets sent to Washington, D.C. to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the United States Navy's biggest nemesis, the Bureau of Ordnance. You, you, Michael. bitch, God! Michael. 
You're very helpful, aren't you? You try to help to. everybody. Do you want to play another game? Okay, if you don't know, the Bureau of Ordnance is a bureaucratic nightmare that does nothing but slow down and halt any progress the U.S. Navy tries to make at literally anything ever. For example, if you remember like a- Basically the anchor that tells you you're in democracy, you can just do anything you want and all that bureaucratic BS, I guess. Oh, everything's working, so what? It's not in the book, slow down month ago when I made the USS Parchy video with loss and red ramage and he was shooting torpedoes at all these Japanese ships but the torpedoes would hit that and then awesome. not blow up because they were duds because it's a known fact that the Mark 14 torpedo fucking sucked and he complained to the chain of command and the chain of command told him too bad you just suck with torpedoes the torpedoes are fine that was the Bureau of Ordnance so basically the go. chain of command has sent Lee to Washington DC to go toe to toe all right I take it back it's not just about the book people it's like a-hole peoples basically because that thing was just insane oh no 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 this is fine you're wrong you can't make that statement unless you know it 100 percent you just basically say we, we not we don't want blame so we just want to say you are you're not good with the shooting so that video was insane so i'm guessing these are the type of people still there uh still in the command there so yeah they're basically tr trying to make sure that you know that they they come out as like the really great people and trying to hold progress from willis or something with these guys because they know that Lee doesn't have the time or the temperament to put up with their bureaucratic bullshit and they're absolutely correct because Willis Lee is about to turn into a wood chipper for red tape. So Lee shows up and he starts learning and finding out about all these fancy new toys the Navy has that are just being held up by bureaucratic nonsense. For example, I don't know, fucking radars. Lee, being the forward thinker that he is, he's like, you can put a screen in my office that tells me where the enemy is so that I can shoot them with my big ass guns without even having to see them. Yeah, put that on every fucking ship in the Navy. What's wrong with you? But don't yeah. worry, because the Bureau of Ordnance and their infinite fucking wisdom doesn't seem to agree with Lee and they don't think they're going to be that big of a deal and they just want to put them on some ships and they don't want to waste all their money on radars because they're dumb, apparently. But they know Lee's not going to take all of that. What the fuck? You're not there. Commander is there. How are you not going to take commander's thing as like important? Like, okay, if commander is saying it, he's the commander is in the fucking name. He knows the ship. He's saying it's going to be significant. Let's try it out at least. At this point, you're just being an a-hole. What about who's overseeing that organization, right? I mean, there is a one all powerful organization in the USA. Everybody has something over their head, right? So who's overseeing them? Why are they not saying like, okay, you are getting in the way now? The, you know, if I think, you know, what is the Senate or Congress would be over them, right? That's where it lands all the time. I don't know. I think only thing, like I said in the start of the video, comes in the way is like nobody wants to take a blame. So nobody's going to say anything or intervene until it becomes a really big issue. Take no for an answer. So they tell Lee that they can't get any more radars due to manufacturing shortages, to which Lee immediately goes, fine, then I'll buy them from Britain. Magically. The Bureau of Ordnance found all the radars he could possibly need. Imagine that. Okay, next order of business, American <laughs> submarines. Their biggest weakness is having purified water because they can't purify water fast enough for how quickly they consume it because the crew needs water and the batteries in the submarines at this point in time. <laughs> Imagine that water goes to the president or whatever. By the way, one of our ship that's doing so well, the radar it's using is from the British people. They're like, what, what, what the fuck you just say? And they go back to that agency like, why, why, where is our radar? So everybody just panicked like, okay, I guess we'll have to give him the radar now. Time also eat a ton of water. Luckily, there's a new EVAP system that's going to allow them to have way more purified water and it's going to be great. Unfortunately, it's held up in bureaucratic red tape. Okay, like they're there, they're done, they've been manufactured, they're ready, but the government wants to run more tests on them, even though everybody in the Navy is like, no, they fucking work. We just, they're just not letting us use them. So Lee just walks in, issues the order to install them, and if anybody has a problem, they can blame him. So Lee's just getting shit done, he's checking things off. Now, at this point in time, whenever you're doing a bunch paperwork for the Navy there's like a status box where you hit it with a rubber stamp to tell everybody how important this paper needs to get through the bureaucratic process now there's three statuses there's routine priority and urgent obviously in that order urgent is like we need to get this done as quickly as possible now everything Lee marked was urgent he didn't give a shit he needed his shit done right now because that's just the type <laughs> of guy he is but unfortunately they were still just not via via less on chocolates urgent do you know how important chocolate is? You want everybody to have depression? Chocolate fights depression, man. Come on.
It's, we, we, I need my chocolate or I'm not, I'm not shooting anything. Not getting it done fast enough to his liking. So he's like, fuck it. I'm going to get my own rubber stamp made that said frantic. So then whenever anybody got Lee's documentation for the first <laughs> time in their entire naval career, there's a new word stamped there in red ink that sounds more important than urgent. So everybody's just like, oh shit, we're doing this first. And then Lee just used. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That is one of the most insane shit ever. Imagine they're receiving that. Frantic, what the fuck? Everybody's just looking at what the hell is a frantic? I don't know, maybe it's like came from president or something, like you know, just run it. <laughs> Use that as first. Uses this to keep on powering through to get more and more shit done. Next thing is to get a schoolhouse stood up for the US Navy that teaches sailors how to read aerial reconnaissance pictures because that's going to be huge in an upcoming war because they're going to need pictures to show where all the reefs and all the atolls are and they're going to have to be able to read those pictures accurately to get proper intel. So at first the chain of command is like, okay, well, we'll get Hollywood involved. They know things about like cameras and shit. That's the right answer, right? And Lee and a couple of other officers that actually have good ideas are like, uh, no, why don't we just go over to Britain and ask them to help us? We'll send a couple of guys over, get them trained by them because they already do this really well and we're on the same team. It would be great. Why wouldn't you do that? We can share information with them and vice versa and we all get better together. Hooray. At which point the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory is like, no, absolutely not because the United States Navy is way better than the British Navy and we know that because we conducted a study that we verified ourselves. Yeah. Okay, now in hindsight, in 1940, look, uh, are, who was more powerful in 1914? I don't know. But to me, it feels like British have been the most powerful Navy for centuries up until what point I remember. And if Britain is already doing something like, yeah, that makes sense, right? Especially with the NATO today, that would, what, that's what would happen, right? So back then, basically, he's saying that it's not that far off. But I think ego's coming to the way. That's it. It's like, well, why, okay, we're not going to Britain. I'm going to decide that. And as far as about the equipment, like, you know, uh, how to like purify water and all this technology when the people made that are like considered the last people to check it off the experts who made that like okay it's working i'm gonna sign it now you have no say in it right who are the people like the, the organization whatever that's coming the way why are these bureaucratic like i don't know who the politician uh, retired military people who are they why are they are the one getting in the way like wh who made you an expert your job is to like manage things logistics Sitting there like, if, if an expert tells you this system is working, pass it on. Why is it delayed? I think we can all agree that's dumb, and that is why Lee ended up sending a guy over there anyways for any bullshit-ass excuse that he could find, and then ended up extending his orders every time they ran short, so he was just over there soaking up as much information and training as humanly possible, and that guy would actually come back and found the Naval School for being able to read aerial photography. Okay, so that's going on. Lee just keeps charging, tackling more issues. Next thing on the docket, the Mark 53, aka the Proximity Fuse. Okay, I cannot stress to you how important this one actually is. This is one of the most important developments developments in World War II is the proximity fuse. Okay, it's basically the new type of anti-aircraft ammunition. Your only options prior to this were like shooting basically birdshot up at planes and hoping you fucking hit them, shooting 50 cows up at planes hoping you hit them, literally trying to hit a plane with a bullet, or you had mechanically timed ammunition where you were shooting it and it had a timer and then it would blow up in midair and you're just hoping that a plane happens to cross at that exact moment and everything works out. You're basically playing the lottery with all of those until the Mark 53 proximity fuse came. Out. Okay, it's a little more complicated than this, but it basically has its own tiny little miniature Doppler radar inside of it. And when it's flying through the air, that Doppler radar is emitting signals and it's reading anything bouncing back at it. And once yeah. something gets close to this ammunition, it starts sending the signals back. And when it gets close, yeah, Doppler effect, wing, that kind of thing, right? So this is so ingenious, man. This is the first time they used it. So before that, it was like all just like wishy washy thing if we're gonna shoot it. This is when science used to write enough and those signals come back frequently enough it knows that it's near a plane in midair and it just blows up on its own yeah. when it gets near enough to the plane okay it's the first type of ammunition that actually knows where the plane is and blows up at the right fucking time it's a big deal so naturally the bureau of ordinance is like wow this thing's incredible this is a total game changer we're gonna go ahead and get in the way for no fucking reason you want to know what they say i'm gonna tell you they say that you're not gonna be allowed to use that new ammunition until it has a 100 percent reliability rating. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and say that again, but slower. The Bureau of Ordnance 
said that you're not allowed to use this new ammunition until it is a hundred percent reliable. Can you understand how fucking stupid that is? You know what's a hundred percent reliable? Nothing. Nothing is a hundred percent reliable. Fucking condoms don't even have a hundred percent reliability, right? You want to get technical? Fucking abstinence isn't even a hundred percent reliable because Jesus was a thing, okay? I'm pregnant. From my finger? No, you don't understand. God has blessed <laughs> me with his child. You banged Kevin God from South Nazareth? You want to know how smart and forward-thinking Ching Lee is? It's like 19 1939 and he already knew that, that is insane man 100 percent is like a stretch you can say that as like a general thing to say but technically if you're gonna say like 100 percent, that is insane what thing says 100 percent? it's always either 99.9 if if somebody's like 100 percent sure they're still gonna put 19.9 because there will be an error thing it's impossible right in physics in science 100 percent is near impossible if not impossible right so yeah i don't know everything has come to a point if you're going to put in technically it has to have 100% ratio, that's just insane. That the future of naval warfare was going to be all about the carriers, and he's 100% right, but he knew at this point in time, okay, because they came and they wanted to build this class of American heavy cruisers. It was going to be the Alaska class. They made two of them, but they wanted to make like fucking 10 of them. And Lee came in and was like, no, those are dumb. You shouldn't have made the first two. Take all those resources, all that money, all that everything. Build more fucking aircraft carriers. He was very adamant about it from the very start, and he ended up being right, and that's exactly what the Navy did, and it had a humongous impact on World War II. Okay, so bearing in mind that he knows that the future of naval power is gonna be all based off of carriers and planes, he goes and adopts a strategy that every American ship, it, we're, we're done. We're done with these like pretty observation decks and shit. If there's room on the deck, we're putting- Basically, why have a big guns on a ship that's gonna shoot from the ship rather than a planes on a ship which can shoot wherever you want? Basically a runaway on ship, why not? Go close to the enemy and just like bombard them with plane. It makes sense anti-aircraft guns. Every American ship is going to look like a fucking porcupine covered with 40 millimeter bofers and 20 millimeter orlicons. Okay, the only problem, he needs all of the guns. This dude sits down and does the math and figures out how many 20 millimeter orlicon, how many 40 millimeter bofers he needs to put on the decks of every ship in the U.S. Navy and puts in a purchase order for it and it gets kicked back because they're like, well, we're not going to put all these on the decks of the ships because, you know, we just don't think that we need that much. And Lee is like, cool, didn't ask for permission to put them on the decks, I just asked to order the guns. To which they're like, shit, he has the authority to do that. And they stamped his thing approved and send it back to him and he gets to order the guns. Then he whips out the old eraser because he filled out the last half of the work order in pen and after it says, order guns, full stop, he erases the full stop and then writes down and install them on every ship in the Navy. Full stop. And then that's what he does. And then every time a ship comes back into port- Oh no, isn't that bordering fraud? I mean, ah. In, if some, I mean, in in USA, in any part, whether it's military or civil, testimonies are seen as like a strong thing. I don't know if that's the case everywhere on the world, but I'm, that's the case in US. At least I know that, right? Which is opposite of science. In science, oh, I know this, no, shut the fuck up, give me the data or go away. Uh, that doesn't happen in like anything law related. So can just like few people like testify? Oh, they didn't say this last bit. He just added it in the later. That would like bordering fraud, wouldn't it? Like, wouldn't that be court martial level of thing? You can't just do that, right? I don't know. It's just like an army of naval dudes come on and just put anti-aircraft guns on everything everywhere. Then December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor happens. At this point, everything changes. Admiral Ernest King, like top dog at the Navy at this point, looks over to Lee. He's like, this guy gets shit done. I need somebody to make sure that the rest of the Navy is taking this seriously. So he promotes Lee to the Admiral of Fleet Readiness. And it is now Lee's job to make sure that the entire U.S. Navy is like ready for yeah, war and treating this how they need to be treating this. And Ching Lee's immediate concern is security because they're, they're way too lax, okay? They're not even checking IDs. They're just letting people through, whatever. I mean, the orders have changed. Like, they've been told, hey, button this shit up. There's going to be spies coming, like, whatever. But doesn't mean they're actually going to do it. Basically, 9-11 of that time, or bigger or small. I don't know how to, how to categorize that. But after 9-11, like, TSA, TSA, yeah, and all that, right? Like, people before 9-11 used to just, like, generally get checked and just, like, walk inside the plane nowadays you have to check in hours before right many things goes around it so the pearl harbor was basically something like that so i can understand how security blowing up all agencies coming around for security around that thing right everything's gonna go and blown up i guess after that blown up in proportion 
So Lee's gonna get to the bottom of that. First things first, remember, prankster at heart. He goes, gets a new military ID made, except this one has a picture of Hitler on it. He then proceeds to go and see how many maximum security naval institutions that he can get into with a US Navy ID with a picture of fucking Hitler on it in World War II, and guess how many he gets into? All of them. Nobody stops him. Like, it's so ridiculous. He's like, I don't, I don't think I look like Hitler, do I? I mean, I guess we're both dudes. Uh, fuck it. We're just gonna have to get more ridiculous. I mean, th th this is not the internet days. I mean, there's only newspaper. How many news channels and TVs around? How many people know Hitler's face that way back then, right? That's the problem. People don't appreciate internet. People don't appreciate freedom of information we have today, right? People can understand a lot of things. Look at me sitting here like knowing a lot of things. I don't think I would know even 10% of things that I know today if I was back then, right? So how many people knew Hitler's face like that? Oh, this is Hitler. I don't know. That could be the reason. So he gets another ID made with the famous female actress Mae West on it. And he's like, well, I definitely don't look like her. Let's see how much shit I can get into now. And then he still gets into a bunch of places that he's not supposed to with this Mae West ID. So basically he's chewing ass and getting everybody ready for the security level required I mean, they for would World know that. War II with espionage and spies and all kinds of shit. Like he's doing full on Ocean's Eleven type shit. He's got subordinates dressing up as butlers, going into fancy hotels, stealing top secret documents from top government officials, whole them until they get reported as stolen just to see how long it takes all kinds of crazy shit so this goes great and as a reward admiral king makes lee the new commander of all of america's fast battle imagine that nobody cares everyone just like bare minimum doing their job and this guy's basically espionaging and doing all these oceans 11 shit like he said and then realize that what, what, what is he doing now oh for god's sake <laughs> just like nobody's taking anything seriously and he's going like a whole whole lot of the level Ships. So now Lee's back in the game. He goes and immediately starts training the entire crew of the USS Washington in gunnery and night combat because he knows that the Japanese Navy has a big edge at night combat, or at least they did before radar. He goes and then masters the radar to the degree that he's probably the most knowledgeable person on these radars in the US Navy, except for the people that literally built them. Sorry, I ran out of time and I had to catch a flight, so we're finishing this video from Texas in my friend Eli's studio. Anyways, back to the story. Not only is he training all of his guys in nighttime combat, he also has to basically go back through and retrain his entire gunnery department because he's not treating the USS Washington the same way. Mm, by the way, your friend has better mic. Every other battleship <clears throat> treats his guns. He's going through and treating each of the nine guns on the USS Washington like it's its own individual sniper rifle. And while he's doing that, getting the guns more and more accurate, he comes to the realization that all the targeting data and the charts that came with the USS Washington from the manufacturer were wrong. They were off. They weren't accurate enough. So he goes to the Bureau of Ordnance again and is like, hey, your charts are wrong. To which the Bureau of Ordnance is like, no, they're not. You're wrong. Except for the fact, obviously, Ching Lee doesn't miss. So he says, fuck it. And he redoes all of the charts and all of the targeting data himself. Over the course of the next couple months, he gets his crew and the guns on the USS Washington so accurate that he ends up having a light cruiser from his task force go 10 miles away. And then he fires the guns towards that ship and has the ship call in and say how close it was to the actual target. And he can walk these shells right up to the wake of this light cruiser without actually touching it. Literally like putting an apple on top of your head and letting your buddy shoot at it with a bow and arrow, except he's doing it with battleships. So fast forward November 1942, the battle for Guadalcanal is going on and the Japanese Navy is being sent to go bombard Henderson Field, which is an American airstrip that is instrumental to the war effort and they can't let it get destroyed. So Lee and his task force get sent in to go defend it. And right out of the gate, this entire thing is a shit show. They're sending in Lee in the USS Washington and the USS South Dakota, the USS Washington sister ship. Now, the real problem, they're sending in four destroyers with them, but these destroyers were picked for the sole purpose of they were there and they were the ones with the most fuel. They had never worked with Lee. They didn't know how he operated. They did not oh, really know no. what was going on, but it just kind of happened. They all got lumped together and got sent out to go defend Henderson Field. So they're out there on patrol. They end up getting basically ambushed by a Japanese task force that opens fire on the destroyers this task force has managed to hug one of these smaller islands to avoid being detected by radar open fire on the four destroyers ended up sinking three of them and critically damaging the third at which point they start opening fire on the uss south dakota at which point ching lee sends a famous radio transmission stand aside i'm coming through 
This is Ching Lee. Now, this Japanese task force has a couple of destroyers. It also has the IJN Otago and the Takao, both of which are heavy cruisers. And they have their flagship, the IJN Kirishima, which was originally a battle cruiser. But in the 1930s, it got a bunch of upgrades in armor and firepower, having it reclassed as a battleship. This is now a battleship versus battleship fight. The Japanese task force is continuing to target the South Dakota. Lee sneaks around the backside, clears the South Dakota, turns all nine of his guns and opens fire directly at their flagship, the Kirishima. And with the first salvo, he hits, and then he keeps hitting, and he hits more, and he's hitting the enemy so hard, so fast, so accurately, they don't even start returning fire. And within the span of five minutes, he manages to hit the Kirishima with 20 main battery hits and 24 hits from his second... Basically, whenever you play video game, and obviously we are the protagonist and we are accurate compared to anybody else, this is what that happened, right? Oh, fighting up and destroyers are destroyed. Wait a minute, here comes Ching Lee. There you go. And he's just gonna accurately shoot the shit out of it. They panic, they run away. That's what's gonna happen here. That is insane. Anything like that happens in real life is like, you know, before watching Fat Trishan, I just realized that reality is not the video game. Reality is not like cartoons and things. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Even Hollywood is not that, you know, like uh, far off, right? Much fucked up thing and much intense thing happened in real life than even it ha happened in Hollywood secondary five inch guns okay each one of those shells is 16 inches in diameter and weighs 1700 pounds willis ching lee just bitch slapped the kirishima with a goddamn car dealership in five minutes okay just so we're on the same page the kirishima has now been reclassified twice the japanese upgraded it and reclassified it from a battle cruiser to a battleship and ching lee has now just downgraded it from a battleship to a fucking coral reef and he did it in five minutes this is the <laughs> last time in world history that a battleship sank another battleship in combat now at this point the uss south Dakota's had so many electrical problems that the guns are down and the radio's down. Lee has no way to communicate with the South Dakota, but he can tell that it's trying to pull away from the fight and still getting attacked by the two Japanese heavy cruisers and the destroyers. So Lee, not knowing the status of the USS South Dakota, decides that he is the most able man in this fight and he needs to get all of their attention so that they can come fight him instead. So he opens fire on the heavy cruisers, trying to get their attention, which he gets. He then proceeds to go the opposite direction as the USS South Dakota so that they quit chasing it down and they chase him instead. So they're chasing him down, but here's the problem. They're chasing him. They're behind him. He can't turn the ship around to shoot at him with the big guns without getting shot in return. And he doesn't want to get his boat shot up because this isn't a boat it's a goddamn precision instrument okay this is a giant fucking sniper rifle i don't want to be taking shots so he comes up with a better plan you see he hasn't just been working on the gunnery skills of the nine 16 inch guns on the uss washington he's also been doing it on all of the five inch guns as well and those turrets can still turn around and hit the enemy and they are so accurate with their fire that lee orders them to start targeting the searchlights on the other ships and they start blowing all the lights out so they're not going to be able to see the uss washington at night and then they start firing star clusters, which is just white phosphorus. The reason they do that is because remember the Japanese don't have radar. That's not how they're targeting the Washington. All their targeting has to be done optically. So now the Japanese guys are looking at night and there's white phosphorus burning as it's floating through the sky and it's gonna fuck up all of their optics and they're not gonna be able to hit the USS Washington. So Ching Lee and the USS Washington do this and just lead the Japanese further and further away from the USS South Dakota until he's confident it that they're going to get away too and then he just slips away into the night virtually unscathed he got hit a single time by a five inch gun which is the equivalent to a grown ass man getting hit with an airsoft gun it's nothing for this admiral lee would be awarded the distinguished service cross by admiral halsey and when he received it his crew demanded a speech he turned around and simply said and i quote you want it i'll wear it which is one of the coolest things i've ever heard a military leader say Ever. For the rest of World War II, it was honestly pretty quiet for the USS Washington. They were involved in some shore bombardments and they mostly just ran anti-aircraft operations for the aircraft carriers because it was a carrier-based war. Then by 1945, wow, all of the Japanese battleships had been recommissioned into coral reefs and they're just- I mean, uh, he's so insanely powerful. They could have used that, used him properly. Like, why not use him like this? I mean, everything we just heard of, obviously that would go into report. And when you read that, how are you like, okay, I if I were there, I would just like, oh, I need to use him in some main attacks and most of the World War II, because that is insane.
Everything he does is insane. There wasn't any reason to have all the fast battleships around anymore. So they took Lee from the battleship and they wanted to use his talents elsewhere because now the biggest threat to the US Navy was kamikazes. And they wanted Ching Lee to be working on the anti-aircraft measures to help prevent this. Unfortunately, this story does not have a happy ending because as he made his way back to America to begin working on those anti-aircraft measures, on August 25th, 1945, he would suffer a massive heart attack that would kill him in a matter of minutes. So in conclusion, that is a story of Willis Ching Lee. He is one of the most important people in naval warfare history, and he gets nowhere near the credit that he deserves. And I would argue that he is absolutely the greatest gunslinger of all time. The definition of a gunslinger is somebody that carries a gun and knows how to use it. I mean, uh, they, they name things after important people. Is there any battleship or anything named after him, Willis Lee or something? use it and i don't think there's ever been anybody on the planet better at that than willis ching lee not only does this man carry a gun and know how to use it he has a gun that carries him and he knows how to use that one too capable of hitting a bullseye with any caliber of gun from a pistol to the 16 inch guns on a battleship this man could do it so thank you for watching best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over the fatelectrician.com quack bang out friend how he's gonna say anything oh. eli doesn't have the same setup as me i can't dramatically turn the lights off as i walk out <laughs> there you go yep ah seriously man this was so insane right him shooting those lights of the japanese ship so they can't see it that's next level right that's some next level accuracy I like how he trained his crew so his crew become arm of him right Look, I want to do this. I know my crew understands what I'm saying. I know my crew can accurately attack just like I would. You, you building your own crew, making them accurate just the way you want. It, you become one unit, isn't it? That's so awesome, right? I think they could have used him during the World War like uh, in a lot of different uh, places. But yeah, he, you know, the, he's the reason why aircraft carriers become uh, such a priority, right? He's the reason behind all these guns and shit. Yeah, this is awesome. Uh, especially like using that, uh, you know, uh, you know, the... Uh, entire aircraft ammo which wasn't the thing before they were just like blindly attacking it uh, so yeah all right well if you like my next one don't forget to subscribe and i'll see you next time